Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Sharon Beltane, and um, along with Scott Terry, I am a co convener of the reporting SIG. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, thanks so much for joining us for this session. This is going to be a medley of experiences with polio reporting. We've got representatives from all different, all kinds of different institutions, and we even have a virtual uh, presenter um, who will talk to you about. Um, his reporting experiences. So this is just to give you a taste of how folio reporting has been implemented at different institutions who are participating in the project so that you can kind of get a sense of, of if you're ex still exploring that or if you're already looking at it, you can get some ideas. And uh, we'd like to get through the slides um, because there are several, five of us. Um, so uh, if we could, Hold off on questions until the end, that would be great. So we're going to try to go through our slides quickly so that you have enough time to ask questions if you have any. So thanks again for joining. Um, so, whoa, that's not working. Okay, so we'll just forget this. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, the speakers today, Axel Dora from Maine's University uh, Library. Did I, I probably said that wrong. <laughs> okay, he'll say it correctly. Uh, we have Stefan Dombeck, who's going to be uh, connecting in virtually. He's from Leipzig University. Scott Perry from University of Chicago. Myself from Cornell. And Ron Shaw, also from Cornell University. So um, Axel is going to kick us off. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> so uh, I'm Axel from uh, University, uh, Mans University, and uh, even that we haven't implemented now, I just want to share my <clears throat> or our uh, experience with with the reporting and how we approach to that. So we have uh, we want to 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 gather all our requirements and adjust them with the regional and international groups in the in the uh, in the community and so uh, this was something I just want to, to share with you to to see that you have your own local needs you should identify and refine them and uh, <clears throat> to see what what what's really needed at, at, this, at one point and then understand the, the current workflows because at, me myself, I'm just just a reporting people. I'm I'm not into any acquisitions or uh, some. Uh, I'm I'm not a librarian, so so I need to talk to to all the people that are the specialists in my my uh, institutions to understand how to, how the workflows are and how the numbers are that they are used to to get uh, how how these numbers are uh, achieved and how how this these numbers are grown. grown. <clears throat> So um, on the other side, you should keep in mind that workflows and data models might differ to that what you have at the moment in your LSP. So um, you should, on the one, one side, you have to identify and then you, you need to understand and to, to have this in mind that this, this workflows, as I said, will, might, might change and that things that you get used to change because you are not only changing <laughs> You you you're changing a whole whole system, and the system might be might 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 cover things different to that what we are you are going to be used to that, and so the problems are it's more not it's not 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 a problem it's more a heads up for you, to 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 see that the data model may differ on distinguished workflows and the catalog source portfolio. <clears throat> uh, what I've I've got out of that is that for you. Is designed to to get uh, to to create data within Folio, but it's also uh, possible to to put pull in data which is created out outside of, of Folio. So, for example, the the catalog um, <clears throat> you are used to you use the SRS to pull in the data for uh, <clears throat> for the bibliographic data into Folio, and generally we will use uh, uh, we will use um, um, union catalogs and there, there the, the, the data source will be outside of Folio 
and it will be pulled in by uh, the um, <clears throat> by the uh, mod inventory update. So things are different, or uh, items might not create it in, in folio, they might create it by outside, by uh, triggered by outside things. So these are some things you just keep in mind. Workflows might be different in particular uses of folio. And what I uh, really learned is that real life data that reflects your situation or your, your institution scenario might not be available at, at the front. So you, all your assumptions you made in front of, of getting the, the, the reports might collapse <laughs> if you get your first <laughs> if you get your first uh, real data in, in folio. So this this is something you you have to keep in mind on that. And so these are just to to be um, to 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 uh, focus your uh, your expectations on what you will get. Yeah. So now I've um, tried to figure out or uh, to point out a little bit about all the structures where you can get your uh, your requirements and and uh, refine them and exchange on on that. We have. Uh, regional or local structures. Uh, at first, well, I spoke about the local institutions groups. You have your specialist groups on resource access, on acquisitions, uh, on 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 ERM, etc. And there you get your your knowledge about your data you want to have or you you want to report on. And you have <clears throat> yeah some your regional groups that have similar setups. You can exchange and and refine your uses and define what 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 uh, things you might want to have uh, we have uh, yeah kinds of work networks or, or consortiums and then we have folio community there you can <clears throat> yeah evolve your requirements with the with the workflows and the, and the, the 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 data that's really stored in folio and there we have the six we have the reporting sequence which is a very uh, yeah a good start to, to ask, hey, I have this 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 uh, uh, requirements. Where where do I get this? Uh, where can I get this? And then you have the functional six, and to to see is are my 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 workflows or are my data, the data that I'm getting used to it, or is it, has it changed in, in folio? And then we have the regional subgroups where we have uh, we where we can uh, yeah, condense your your um, <clears throat> Yeah, your needs with with uh, similar institutions or similar requirements to bring into the six and evolve your requirements. So, lastly, I draw a little bit of steps how to to collaborate uh, analyze your your things. And so, I have um, at first year you define your needs in your local institutions, and these are on in, in local structures. And then we have adjust yourself with regional peer groups within network or similar environments that can be local structures as well as already in, 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 in the folio community. And then you can, you, you are able to identify the given workflows and numbers within the folio context. So you see what does that mean in, in the folio meanings. And after you did that, <laughs> you might refuse <coughs> Your folio, your, your reporting solution. You could find a suitable report approach made by uh, the reporting six uh, and and provided in the folio analytics uh, repository. There are uh, um, approaches of uh, of SQL uh, reports. There are approaches of uh, derived tables where several data has pulled together to 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 get that data. But if you if it's not there. <laughs> You might work with other uh, functional subgroups and six to on refinement for development to to get your data that are not at this point is in folio or you are not used to have this in folio. So this is a little bit of step through how to get if you are starting with folio and you're not not really familiar what what you you're going to do. It's something I've. What 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 was my my thing? How to to retrieve your um, folio and your uh, your your recordings and your uh, requirements within folio reporting? 
So this is it for now. <laughs> Thank you. I think for the next step, and I'll see if Stefan, can you unmute you? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm Stefan Dombeck from Leipzig University, and uh, I'm also the team leader from the ERM reporting group and the special interest group D reporting. It's a German uh, subgroup of the reporting SIG uh, that uh, discuss uh, special requirements in the German community. And today I uh, will give you a little overview about uh, the um, experience that we have in Leipzig University uh, with the FOIA reporting. Um, at first, some basic points. Um, our FOIA system is currently only in productive use for ERM and it's order and invoice management. So that means uh, we have some requirements for uh, reports um, that show the data for expenses and some other data. And we have a, a self-hosting system with its own administration. So um, in this case, um, we have also additional reports uh, for the recreation process and for tests. And at the moment, uh, we are looking for a good reporting solution. Uh, MetaDB is one possible candidate for that. Uh, but until then, uh, we will create reports directly via the folio database. Okay, uh, uh, we lost some uh, figures here, uh, but um, Go for it again. yeah, okay, here. <laughs> that, that's the little uh, data workflow that we have um, in Leipzig. Uh, we have the Folio database, uh, a little reminder, we are a self hoster and we have direct access to the FOIA database. And we create the reports with the Beaver uh, in the FOIA data with the FOIA database, and then we export the yeah, the result um, directly in the Beaver, or we load um, the data directly uh, in Excel uh, sheets uh, via ODBC uh, drivers. Yeah, here, here you can see a, a screenshot uh, from uh, the program Microsoft Excel. And uh, we integrate our reports here in um, the interface uh, from Microsoft Excel. Uh, you can uh, set uh, ODBC interfaces in your system, and then you can select the ODBC interface in Microsoft Excel, and then you can um, copy and paste your uh, query uh, into the, the text field here. Uh, it's a SQL statement field, it's optional field. And then when you click OK, uh, you can directly uh, get the data from the database from Florio. Um, you can do this in different ways. Um, the best practice is that you install the ODBC driver and, and the settings on the computers. And that means every user has to, to set up these drivers and the settings, but uh, the administrators can also roll out this via an update. So that, um, we had an update uh, with the regular uh, updates and after the updates, uh, all the users get the get the the, 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 the settings for ODBC drivers. So and they don't have to do anything uh, for that. Uh, so they have the, the ODBC interface on their system after the restart from the computer. So and 
And uh, best practice is also that you create and separate for your database account um, that has only read-only permissions. And then with the read-only permissions, uh, you have to secure that nobody can break anything in your database. So, and another point is that you have to check the right management if it's necessary and who can access what with the system? Oh no, <laughs> presentation is crashed. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the, we need the, the provisions. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's the right one. <laughs> okay, yeah, you have to check the right management um, to see who can access what with this account. So, um, and maybe you have to check the firewall settings um, if it's necessary or useful. You can also use uh, Fuse um, to query um, the, the data. So it, it's also possible to give access only um, to the views, not the underlying tables in the database. Uh, so if you have dashboards uh, that shows any data, uh, then you have only give an um, extra account on the database for this dashboard and the, the account only gets um, the, the rights for this view and not to the entire database. Yeah, our current reports uh, contains information from agreements, licenses, the e usage app, uh, then for the budgets, information, invoices, orders, users, especially for the permission sets. And open access is currently in the test phase, but we have um, two prototypes to see the, the data inside this app. Our FOIA system has several types of servers. We have um, three, uh, um, three types of servers, testing, staging, and productive. And with each new FOIA version, we have to check our reports um, because sometimes the data schema can change within FOIA with the new versions and then uh, your reports crashes and then you have to rewrite or uh, create updates for these reports. And you have also to check non-reporting requirements. So, and for all these reports, we have an internal repository. And in this repository, you have um, uh, different branches and each branch is for the different uh, for your versions and if you have a report for a specific for your version, you can select the uh, branch that you need, and then you can get your report. Yeah, our goal, what, what we would like to do is um, we would like improve this workflow um, because we have to establish uh, a workflow like in our current old system. Um, this sh should be done later, but um, in our test phase, we are looking for a um, uh, solution for that. And uh, we, uh, we have different kinds of um, reports, error reports, standard reports for uh, users via the UI report module and we see the LDP app in Folio as a candidate to uh, give this um, opportunity for the um, for the users also in Folio via the LDP app, and then we have reports on demand, expert reports. So that's more if individual reports came up from uh, the members of the library. 
So we have to create um, an, a special report for them. So, and of course we have statistics, uh, we have the DBS statistics. It's an annually statistic in Germany uh, that we have to deliver uh, for the community. Yeah, and then we have to find a good reporting solution that works with crystal reports from SAP and our staff are all trained in SAP crystal reports, not in SQL. So, and we also need a special design of our reports. Um, for example, we need um, barcodes as scannable barcodes in code 3.9. And then we have to export these reports as PDF and then they can print it out uh, if they want. Um, yeah, unfortunately, crystal reports cannot process uh, JSON objects from folio. So that's the reason why we're looking for a new reporting solution. Yeah, that, that's the goal for the workflow that we need. Uh, we need a reporting solution between the folio database and crystal reports to export the, the created reports in different formats. Yeah, and I think that's all. And yeah, the next one is Scott. Let's see again. Yeah. Um, just a note, Stefan, um, it's about three o'clock here. What time is it where you you are? Uh, it's 10 p.m. <laughs> Thank I, you I, so I, much. I, I, drunk, I drunk some coffee and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Hey, everyone. I'm Scott Perry. I'm the head of collection support at the University of Chicago. I'm also the co convener of the Portfolio reporting SIG, at least have now or will be in two weeks or something like that. Um, I'm going to talk. Everybody <laughs> that feels good. Um, I will uh, just talk a little about about the experiences in Chicago. And first, I want to talk. That makes sense. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit of the history about how, how Chicago has done reporting over time. And because we've been, we've always had, to, we had direct access to the database we reporting for various systems beginning in 1995. So people were used to querying systems directly very early on and, and regularly. That does not mean they use the same reporting tools or interfaces. And so there is very dispersed reporting across multiple groups and areas, and there's still others. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about acquisition, finance related, metadata management, resource access. And there are other areas too where there's reporting going on. But And there are also some areas where we have heavy use of in-app options. And you heard reference to one earlier in the previous session and, then, and such, but I, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. We also have both LDP and VetaDB available now and have subsequently implemented Folio in January of 2022. Yes, two fiscal year rollovers. Um, and so that's what we're running. And I'll, I'll resource access actually worth a lot of historical data related to circulation they wanted to work with. We didn't have a lot of time prior to migration in January 20, I said January 2015, I thought I corrected that, to create new reports needed for daily work. We also hired a developer to map the existing MS access reports to LDP so that the, the data could be derived from LDP and then yeah, does it work? In particular, one need was the need to link to external databases in real time, Aries and Iliad in this case, for 
I, I think it was poll reports, pick reports, and that sort of thing. Um, my expertise is more in the acquisitions area, but I, so people have been kind enough to help me with this. Um, so they're basically pulling information from LDP or MetroDB into MSS as a real time link series in the early under possible. So this is kind of what we had when we went live and, and when we were trying to model this. So we have the pull list and the access database and the lay And I should thank Christy Thomas for this slide because she used it last year, but I thought it was perfect for what I had wanted to talk about here. And I don't have a lot of time, so I will <laughs> focus on that. Um, and metadata advanced reporting relies heavily on LDP, LDP and MetaDB for workflow-related reporting. And they mainly use the acquisitions and inventory tables in full reporting and public schemas and the SIS smart tables. For acquisitions primarily used related to loads of incoming orders and non at effect invoices. And they're currently making use of derived tables as created by the reporting set for many queries that are beginning to explore alternatives using MetaDB. Uh, and they expect to implement those within the next year, I would expect. And finance and acquisitions finance related reporting. Here we are doing a lot of things where we're working in app for immediate needs, immediate consumption. Uh, and that's used for lists of orders or invoices and many fund balance inquiries. Uh, you can you can export CSV files from the UI for orders. Krista mentioned that in the last session. Orders, invoices, and finance. And then use Excel to read and manipulate the data. It's easy to use on demand. It's real-time data. No SQL required. But it's not useful for more complex needs. We also have some helper apps that uh, uh, one of our people in systems has created. And these actually basically, they near, they create, they transport the data into basically tables. It's basically, so there's, it's easy to use and easy to understand and, and for most people. And, and one of these, for instance, we use to, uh, we extract all of our donor information, every, item that's been purchased in the last year and tied in both for, because it's broadly needed for people to see how much has been spent on a particular endowment or something. And also we use it for the reporting to the donors themselves, the development selectors go in and select titles from this and, and flag them and then development extracts them from that and just includes it in the reports to donors. I've also created many groups within the finance via app that relate to specific reporting needs within finance, things where we need to know something right away. For instance, or there are broad subjects, for instance, humanities, social sciences, so they want to know how much they spent. Anyone can go in and look at that and see that. Uh, and there's a few subdivisions of that. They're by selector. Any selector can go in and look at their group group named after them and view what their balances are, what's in spent. And note that this in groups, you can go by fiscal years too. You can go to current fiscal year, last fiscal year. In our case, we have three fiscal years going now. Find uh, this quick view of the current state. Say. Uh, the same fund can appear in multiple groups. It's really help, helpful because it's just helping pre-slicing things sort of analysis. analysis. And within groups, it summarizes expense classes. So, which is very helpful. But group results are not exported. So, um, just a quick thing. And this is just one of the groups. It's, it's our social sciences serials. We have, I just have, since we haven't put budgets in yet, I felt that I could show the, share this slide um, <laughs> without getting in trouble. 
Uh, so, but you can get a sense of this is what you see at the top. And then beneath that, there's a list of all the funds. And beneath that is the list of all the expense classes. So, and that was, I think, about my seven or eight minutes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Now I'm the chair. <laughs> okay. Yes. Hello. Uh, what Cornell did to prepare for implementing OVP1 and Folio? Mm -hmm. So we used Voyager, um, and uh, we have been using the same system for 20 years, so that was a lot of change management. Uh, we used uh, Microsoft Access Databases, pulling data directly from the transaction system. And uh, the application system went live on July 1st, 2021, and uh, through much effort, the folio reporting system using LVP also went live on July 1, 2022. I, if I could show on the slide the blood, sweat, and tears, um, <laughs> I would. So you have to imagine for yourself. <laughs> but we had all of our critical reports in place, so that was uh, very good. Um, we started with SQL queries um, uh, against our LVP and then added Tableau dashboards and automated Excel reports using um, VBeaver uh, Enterprise Edition um, and a year later. So um, we've, uh, we're have at the point where uh, the main queries are available and so now we can look at different ways of delivering reports. It's the <laughs> sorry. Okay, now it's ready. Okay, uh, so uh, this is just a, a quick overview of how our system works. We write the queries in Beaver, if the um, LDP one that's refreshed nightly, um, we can uh, output to Excel and we get our nightly data refresh, and then later later we uh, layered layered in. Uh, Tableau dashboards. Um, so those are also hitting the LDP1 open database. And uh, Bandana Shop, um, also from Cornell, is going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, the application uh, server uh, and library data platform software have gone through rapid development um, since everything was first released. Um, so it's great to have new features. It's great to have developing software, but it also has this effect on everything behind it. So it hits reporting as well. Oh, I didn't know we were going to have the blah, blah, blah data field. <laughs> oh, blah, blah, I didn't know that was going to be changed into a different data type. So your queries need to be maintained. Um, so we uh, do a lot to test and maintain our queries and try to find out about um, new changes that are going to impact reporting. And a lot of that comes from work on the report itself. So um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, I think, most important things we do is to keep people abreast of, of things that are going to impact reporting down the line. Um, so as the number of reports and dashboards we were providing users increased, their reliance on those tools really, uh, those tools increased. Um, so what happened was uh, we just had a production server, um, and if it went down, or if the data transfer didn't work, or if something happened, uh, then no reports that day. And you can imagine how fun that is. Um, so uh, what we have learned to do is uh, to have a test server. We uh, requested from our uh, hosting services to have a test environment um, so that we could before new uh, changes fixes were released, uh, we could have them go to the test for the server first, make sure that our reports are running. We would do a lot of um, uh, work to uh, check everything um, and then move those changes to production. That has been very uh, helpful for us. So I recommend that if you're able to do it. So this is the process we go through, and we worked with our vendor to establish this process as a, as a best practice, as, as this is the way we do things. It's tested first, and then we go to production. 
So uh, we have more, probably more than 100 uh, users at the Cornell Library. And um, our developers, as part of implementation, need to develop an SQL skill set. Um, the reaction to reporting was mixed, depending on the comfort people had with running SQL. Even if they hadn't written the reports, just looking at the code was very scary uh, to some of our users. And to others, it was a, a delightful and exciting. Uh, so we have the range at Cornell. Uh, and uh, so it really depended on their experience and interest in SQL and reporting. Um, so uh, many users prefer a user-friendly intuitive interface to library data. So we've been concentrating more on that now that we've been live for a little while. So the automated reports and catalog dashboards are um, very uh, useful to people and you know, very popular. So we continue to, to develop that. Um, we have everything on a GitHub public repository. So if you're interested in taking a look at what we've developed, um, our SQL is out there uh, to share with folks. And I encourage other institutions to do the same in Spirit of Folia. So um, this is my this is my golden nugget slide. Okay, so if there's anything that you can take away from, from this, from our go live, um, it's it's going to be this slide right here. It was really useful for us to build a reporting team with representatives from key reporting areas. So we have people from finance, we have people from circulation, we have people from acquisitions. Uh, that made a big difference in our ability to pull together all of our critical reports prior to go live and to continue to support people as they identify new requirements document your requirements. <laughs> that way, um, anyone can start working on them who has the experience uh, from your reporting team. Uh, test, whoops, test the report delivery interface with users and get feedback. Um, so uh, that's, that's an important one. Uh, draft and test critical reports and test system if you can. Um, set up, it was, it's been very helpful for us to have a central GitHub repository, everything's there. Um, so as we um, move to MetaDB, we have our code all in LVP. We will just take what we have in LVP and move it over to MetaDB. Um, continue to test, plan, refine, and expand your queries as you go. Um, set up good support systems if you can um, so that people can get the training and documentation that they need. Um, consider transforming and migrating the legacy data into a, a new reporting database um, into your into your new reporting database, or you can do it to a separate one for a while and then bring it into if you can bring it into Postgres. Um, it's it we're just seeing this now, so people are asking us for trend reports, and we have our data from Voyager, so we can pair that with what we have in Folio to give them, you know, the last ten years, um, even though you know we have uh, not been in Voyager for a while, so. It's been uh, very, very helpful and will pay off for you if you can do it. It takes a lot of effort uh, to do that, and depending on what you're in, but it's very helpful. Okay. You're going to. So yeah, so I cannot That's it. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Vandana, and I'm trying to get my video so that's not showing up anywhere. Okay, sorry. Um, we decided to move to Tableau, as Sharon said, we had quite a mixed response when we first went into getting our reports. 
we had a fair group of people who wanted a much easier way to get to their data and to get to their daily reports. So we decided to go the way of Tableau. And instead of going into all these details on slides, I decided I'm just going to show you dashboards. That might be the easiest way to um, tell you all about them. Yeah, it's what I want. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is that I don't want to show any slides now. Why don't I just get away from the slides and just show you dashboards and tell me what I'm going to say? Okay, so the question is this. <laughs> why dashboards? Because first of all, Tableau and dashboards are a very popular visual analytics platform. As you see over here, I'm giving you one of our more used reports. For example, just giving you things like loans and circulations and overall counts, that's kind of easier to get from different systems. But very, very specific things which are used for day-to-day -day service, for example, like missing items and um, items in transit that have been in transit for 500 days. We kind of want details of these things. So here there's an instant data availability. Absolutely, there's no messing with SQL, with Deep Beaver, with anything. And there's pretty much a zero learning curve on the part of the users and the end users over here. Is this pretty interactive over here? I mean, you're looking for got your missing item summary here. And then if you want details of missing items, there they are. And I'm sorry that things are showing up over here. I don't know why. Yes. But there's nothing showing up here for me to say yes to. So just uh uh, so Sharon says yes. <laughs> okay. I'm seeing a different thing here and a different thing showing up over there, so it's really confusing for me as to what's going on. Uh, so we'll take questions again. It was just a chat. Okay. 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 So okay. you just say, we'll take questions again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So for example, here we can just show missing item details. Um, Tableau allows you to do all kinds of filters which is very easy and very interactive for the user. Um, we can do missing status data over here and give all kinds of details there. And the other thing that's commonly used is the in-transit items. You know, we, we can set this as a query in the background, which I'm about to show you over here. So these are, for this dashboard, we have two different SQL queries running in the background. These are directly connected to the LTP. We have a missing items SQL query and an in-transit items SQL query. And they're both running in the background and we can have these different views come up over here. Just to show you a quick idea of how this works in actual Tableau, if you haven't used the Tableau software over here, this is my setup page for Tableau. And as you can see here, I have two different queries running over here. And for my data source, over here, all I need to have is I need to have permissions to connect. I need my permissions to connect here into um, into the LDP, and this is through our host system over here. And once I have all the connections, I can run my different queries that run in the background. And we refresh these um, once a day in the morning, and then the data are put in kind of a data extract. So each time a user looks at a Tableau dashboard, it's not rerunning the query. The data are already extracted and kept available for them over there. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is, okay, this is this was just the loans and renewals. Let me move things around over here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, another great thing about Tableau is that you can put data from different data sources on the same view over here. So we can have um, data not only from different queries, but from actual different data sources being brought in here. So in, for example, over here, we've got some that are actually running a live query and putting um, the results into this data. And for some that take a very long while to run, for example, when we're doing an items, physical materials items count, this SQL query needs to use mark data and sometimes it can run on and on for 20 minutes. So for this, since we're only updating this report quarterly, we have this, this data running, the query runs, and it puts all the data into an Excel file on the box folder. And so my dashboard goes and connects to that particular box folder and the Excel file. So I've got one view, half of this view is showing you 
data from that Excel file. The other half is showing you something running from a query directly. And I could have it from altogether a different source too, if I wanted to. Okay, and I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to say over here. Okay. That's pretty much all I can think of over here. Um, one very important thing that each um, dashboard or each set of dashboards can be given its own set of permissions. So to kind of show you our backfield, this is the Cornell um, Tableau server where Cornell University Library has a space on the Tableau server over here. And we can create different folders here because we have our dashboard separated by type of use. So it's like user access or it's for selectors. Um, there's the finance and budget office. We won't even touch those or go close to those. So we can set up each group of reports with different permissions. So some are open um, to all um, staff at the library and some are open to just very, very specific people. So that's the way you can have some kind of permission control happening over there. And now the last thing to say, some of the cons of using Tableau is definitely um, the cost of the Tableau software itself licensing and this cost is just about to go up as they kindly informed us and and since they were sold to salesforce um their service has not been exactly stellar but still we're <laughs> we are continuing with them it's a little bit time consuming when you start off to actually create these dashboards and then you, you do need to have somebody more or less dedicated to your dashboards and you also do have to maintain them because we're having data from different sources things are breaking things are changing and they're constantly in this learning path. But that said, it gives you data any which way you want in any level of detail you want. And our selectors have been really, really happy. So I haven't shown you any of the selector dashboards because clearly I can. But just for example, the things we have for them is things like approved invoices and cost by publisher. And then we have um, details such as, you know, fund details with expense class. The, this kind of information is used by them pretty much every single day to track their um, track their expenditures. So um, that's about pretty much all I have to say about dashboards. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, we can take questions now. There is a question on Zoom, so I'd like to just jump over to that if I may. Um, yeah, I'm just going to... Okay, wow. All right. This uh, AV system, it's almost like implementing folio. It's uh, <laughs> quite complicated. Um, okay, so question coming in, thank you so much, uh, is, oh, um, we're all members of your engine train on SQL. We did go through SQL training, um, and so the combination of um, training materials that are out there and just on the ground running, writing things and getting more and more experience. And we did a lot of collaboration and helping each other and, uh, as we went. Um, could I recommend? Yes, there are, there are a number of uh, SQL tutorials um, on the reporting SIG um, wiki. Uh, so um, if you go there to the training section, um, you'll find uh, a whole bunch of material on uh, SQL and specifically um, targeted toward people who are trying to implement LP or um, MetaDB. Um, let's see, any other, oh, you're welcome, okay. Other questions, um, it could be for anybody. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you yeah, need yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. I just wondered, uh, is there an open source Alternative to Pablo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that too. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll be talking about it tomorrow. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't think you're putting it. It's called Metabase. It, it's an open source uh, web based thing. It looks a lot like Tableau, but is open and is really awesome. So, you know, my session tomorrow. Game of self promotion in action. We all do it. <laughs> We're all guilty. Um, Wills has a question. Uh, could be for any any one of us or Stefan even. Uh, who's still with us? Any? Um, how many people have implemented reporting? 
Okay. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, we are uh, happy to share experiences and you know, uh, warn you about the gotchas, all that stuff. Um, let's see what's going on. Stefan, do you have any other words of wisdom for us? Oh, there's Stefan. Yes, great. <laughs> yes, yay, yay. Yeah, the disembodied voice of this. <laughs> Strange. Um, I think that was a yeah. goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a like, Oh, yeah, that's part right. I'm going to go to bed now. Um, thank you, Stefan. Okay. Thank, thank you for clicking around the, the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think, unless you have any questions, um, thanks so much for joining us. And um, we'll see you. And please feel free to ask us questions, reach out here or later on Slack or what have you. Thank you so much, everybody.